Hello and welcome to ABLE's World Hepatitis Day event. Um, for those that are in the Eastern States, good afternoon and for those joining us. Today's webinar, Treatment as Prevention, What Does the Future Hold for Injecting Drug Users? With new treatments for Hepatitis C on the horizon, treatment as prevention is increasingly becoming the focus for many researchers and clinicians in the field. It's posited as a potential game changer for the future of Hep C. And today's webinar hopes to critically explore treatment as prevention from the perspective of injecting drug users. My name's Angela and I work here with ABLE and the Hep C team. And we're fortunate today to have an experienced panel of speakers. Um, I'll introduce them in more detail when it's their turn to speak. We have Jude Byrne from ABLE, Professor Greg Daw from the Kirby Institute, and Magdalena Harris, who is coming to us via video from the UK. And we're particularly lucky to have Magdalena. She did offer to record for us in the middle of the night, but as a young mum, we've let her off the hook. And we have a pre-recorded presentation from Magdalena. For those of you that are new to webinars, um, there is uh, the ability to put questions as we go through and we'll be collating those questions and at the end of all of the three presenters we will hope to get to as many of those questions as possible. We know that some of you have already sent questions through and we'll be collating those. So we hope to have a lively discussion and debate at the end of the presentation. Uh, each of the presenters will speak for around 10 to 15 minutes each and as I said they will speak in order and then at the end we will reserve that time for the questions that um, you as participants have for us. So without further ado I'll um, hand over to our first speaker. Our first speaker is Jude Byrne. She is a Senior Project Officer here at ABLE. Um, she's currently the Chair of the International Network of People Who Use Drugs, Input. Input is a global network of people who use drugs who work to increase the human rights and dignity of injecting drug users worldwide. Um, Jude has been active in the drug user movement for over 30 years. She's worked tirelessly for improvements in the lives of drug users. And she has a particular focus in her work here at ABLE in developing up-to-date resources for the injecting drug user community living with hepatitis. So Jude's well placed to start us off, kick us off in today's webinar, so I'll hand over to you. Good morning everyone, so glad you could join us. Um, sometimes in my work in the peer-based drug user movement I feel as if I turned around from concentrating on the usual tasks and find the world slightly shifted on its axis. Things happen very fast and it's like this in relation to the treatment and prevention phenomena whose impact has already been widely felt in the discussion about the future of our community in hepatitis C. What happened while my back was turned was the development and subsequent research results percent in genotype 1 and the pharmaceutical company's potential to develop a pan-genotypic treatment, one pill a day, a shorter treatment time that needs none of the blood work such as genotyping and various other costly blood tests currently associated with hep C treatment. An added bonus is the absence of interferon, ribavirin, whose side effects have made people reluctant to commence treatment and whose side effects add cost to treatments. So we have a situation where the possibility of a new once a day drug that needs no genotyping and little blood work and whose side effects appear easily tolerated and cost effective. This cluster of information was combined with modelling data that indicated that hepatitis C could be eliminated if treatment was used as a prevention activity in and of itself. If it seems too, too, too good to be true, and it also is a wee bit naughty of the researchers, who call us the hard to reach population, so how do they come by the figures they're using? If they don't even know how many of us there are, or how many of us take up drug use each year, or leave it for that matter. And modelling can only be as good as the figures inserted into it. No account of the human and social factors that could possibly impact on how this modelling data is then used, the majority having little or no personal knowledge. 
Our hesitation comes from our communities remembering our history because oftentimes the best intentions when acted upon in our communities are harmful, devastating consequences. For example, the Global Fund, which funds harm reduction and HIV programs in various parts of the world, were providing money in Asia that was used to fund forced detention and treatment rehabilitation places for people who use drugs, in which they were being beaten and tortured. The Global Fund now has an internal human rights watchdog and recipients have to show that they are adhering to certain ground rules because that was many ruined broken lives later. What everybody has to keep in the frontal lobe, in their frontal lobes, is drug users are not the community's most adored population, although that's a question that we have to ask why, and it's been reinforced time and time again over the past three epidemics, HIV, hepatitis C and hepatitis B, that only the minimum and only those services that seek to directly act on viral transmission are grudgingly provided. No change to the structural or social barriers and inequities that support an environment where the use of drugs is a rational choice when living in the mire of social dislocation and exclusion or just to see the existential angst and dare I say just for pleasure. I'm not going to discuss the war on drugs. It's failed. People use drugs, enough said. But I do want to do a quick history of hepatitis and its presence in our community and how often it was ignored or glossed over in the past 40 years or more. Liver diseases such as jaundice was characterised by Hippocrates and found to be infectious in the 8th century. By 1885, hepatitis was found to be transmissible through blood transfusions and syringes when epidemics of jaundice broke out during the wars of the 17th and 19th century. Physicians in the early 1900s recognised that hepatitis A was spread by person-to-person -person contacts. And in 47, McCallum classified viral hepatitis into two types. viral hepatitis A or infectious hepatitis and viral hepatitis B or serum hepatitis. The use of blood transfusions during the war provided the first clinical studies of serum hepatitis. And in 56, Haven wrote a paper which stated, the role of contaminated syringes and needles in the artificial transmission of hepatitis is well recognised. In this regard, attention has been called to the frequency of occurrence of artificially transmitted hepatitis among narcotic addicts and the possibility of there being an important source of carriers. Again in 1960, Levine states the high incidence of homologous serum hepatitis among youthful drug users has been reported by other investigators. So back in 1960, when drug use was taking off, particularly in the US, doctors knew it would and could be transmitted among our communities. There was no interest, there was no information, and there was no education. In Australia in the 1970s, at Fairfield, they were storing blood from HPV-positive patients and what they then called non-anon B. So this is 15 years before the HIV epidemic. And the prevalence in our community was acceptably high before any intervention or, or prevention of transmission occurred in comparison to HIV. Oh, sorry, I just, I just missed something. I'm having trouble with my slides. Um, um, however, with HIV, the sexual transmission component made interventions a necessity. When I started using 40 years ago, going yellow was almost a fact of life. No one really cared about it. In fact, it was almost de rigueur that as an injecting drug user, you, you got yellow at some stage. No doctor ever told a drug user I knew that B or C could be transmitted by contaminated equipment, and they must have done it way back then, and if they didn't, they bloody well should have. Hepatitis C is a preventable disease. My unease with this whole scenario comes from why do we need to use treatment as prevention for a preventable disease? We have proven prevention programs in place, researched uphill and down dale. With hepatitis C, we're also working with a very hardy virus whose prevalence in our community was unacceptably high before any interventions occurred. We couldn't, we couldn't even get research on how long the virus lived outside the body or in its six of decades. So saying the current prevention programs are not adequate can't be based on knowledge, as we've never had an adequate Hep C response. Current pre prevention as prevention programs include NST, USA just reinstated the federal ban on NST, it has some OST. China has very small numbers of both. I think Greg has a slide that will give you I mean, a, a better look at, at all those figures. But even in countries like Australia, Britain and France, 
No one has adequate NSP coverage or even remotely adequate opiate substitution programs. And there's also a huge need to substitute stimulant programs. The Global Commission on Drug Policy even states it sees an urgent need for more research on maintenance and other therapeutic approaches to managing stimulant use. So we have minimal and inadequate prevention as prevention programs globally and locally, while simultaneously having enhancement of transmission scenarios. Jail is a risk factor in and of itself, and the number of drug users going to jail is simply unacceptable and also a fertile ground for hep C transmission. Homelessness, Lack of work, social isolation, units to injecting. People know what the risks are, but they're the big picture, social, criminal and justice issues, and no one wants to deal with them. Another issue that comes up here is the discussion of needing to minimise injecting as a behaviour to minimise transmission. I see it in every paper on the subject. And as a long-term injector, I wouldn't wish my lifestyle on anybody, but I absolutely believe that people have the right to agency. Having lived in a pre-AIDS world, we're trying to stop injecting as the government's main agenda. It ain't pretty for us. Rehab and jail, I recall, were the options and are foraging in the bins to use fits. If we can properly do prevention as prevention, we should not need treatment as prevention, and that's the best outcome for our community. It also, st it also stops other bloodborne viral transmissions. It helps with bacterial infections, drug overdose, and the health of our community as a whole. Before we get to treatment as prevention, let's have a look at treatment as treatment, which is currently barely, barely working. And I can't see that changing unless we have a meteoric change in the social and legal status of drug users. In Australia, less than 1% of the 250,000 people affected by hep C are being treated. Stigma and discrimination are exhausting drug users. They've had so many frightening experiences of a, of, a, of, a, of a condition they don't really understand and of treatments that they've had so many myths and misconceptions about that they shelve it, you know, most of them until they're very, very ill and often it's too late for them to have treatment. Our community isn't engaged with the medical profession on hep C or anything else really. We don't have enough peer-based groups or workers to overcome poor access of information. But even if drug users were up to speed, there aren't enough places in the current clinics, even for the low numbers that are presenting. There are long waiting lists in specialist hospital liver-based clinics, and there's been little progress in expanding GP models of shared care. Too often we are being warehoused, as they say, popped in a nice, comfy little place because it's more convenient for us to be treated, even if that person wants treatment now. We can surmise this is due to a reluctance to treat us, including those on OST. Most medical people don't understand the day-to-day -day barriers of treatment for people who inject drugs, poor vein health, complex comorbidities, multiple health problems, lack of personal support, poverty, housing issues, rigid drug treatment programs, and the ongoing impact of criminalisation. And now is when we're seeing the 30-year effects of liver damage, bloated abdomens, yellow skin and death. And it's a very untidy, ugly death that liver failure visits upon you. Now is when drug users are actively talking about treatment, yet no serious work is being done to address these social factors and no amount of new pills will do anything to change that. Additional barriers to treatment prevention based on current modelling at unrealistic costs. It currently costs the Australian government $70 million per annum to work with. It's 6 to $8 billion per annum. The, the Australian government simply aren't going, to, aren't going to pay that. I don't think many other governments are, given we're one of the most um, responsive to, to this community anyway with this, um, with this particular virus. With treatment as prevention, if treatment as prevention doesn't take off as the main game in hep C elimination, if drug users aren't fronting up inadequate numbers, and in the world as it sits today, and the way drug users are being treated, I see a future of forced hep C treatment, either in jail and rehabilitation, or as a way to avoid a jail term, or as the only way to be enrolled in an NSP or OST program. 
And let's not pretend that this is not a possibility. Just look at what Russia did in the Crimea or look at life before HIV for drug users. We have to remember who gains here. The first group that comes to my paranoid mind is pharma. What it gives to them if we are just treated and treated, then reinfected and then retreated because of inadequate prevention as prevention measures. Or if you think I'm being harsh, just look at how they've costed current available treatments at $86,000 US per treatment for a non pangenitivic pill which has been costed to under 1,200 US per treatment. Governments, governments get to slow down and stop un unpopular prevention activities such as NSP and OST. Doctors, well doctors get to treat heaps more of us but given how most of them feel about us I don't think they'll see that as a bonus. Researchers get to research and model. I want to end on a note of hope here because I'm sure I read somewhere and modelling tells us there's enough food to feed every person on earth. No one needs to be starving. And let's sit on that for a second. So I really don't think we need to nitpick the finer points of the modelling issue, but rather be vigilant to ensure it doesn't inadvertently harm our community and lead to a deprioritisation of the current appalling scaling and funding of harm reduction while also hampering any new gains such as amphetamine and heroin, heroin programs. No activists would stand in the way of any program or process that improves the health and well-being of our community. We just have to make sure it's in our community who realises the net gains. We have to be up to speed on this issue or it will run away from us and it's our lives and our community. We must own this debate. Thank you. Thanks, Jude, for asking me to take part in this webinar, um, albeit from afar and ahead of time. So happy World Hepatitis Day to everyone and I'm coming to you from London. Um, a little bit ahead of time so I don't have to get up and see them in the night. So Jude's asked me to provide a brief overview okay. of treatment as prevention of hepatitis C Thank and a little bit of critical reflection which then she and Greg can pick apart to their heart's desire. Okay. So what is treatment as prevention? Well this concept is most common in regard to HIV treatment and came about with the discovery that ART related viral suppression significantly reduces HIV transmission. So this has implications for treatment prioritisation and decision making. While previously people with HIV may have only started treatment when they became symptomatic or when their CD4 count dropped below, below a certain level, now individuals may choose or be encouraged to start treatment earlier in order to prevent onward transmission. So how may we ask is this relevant to hep hepatitis C? Well unlike with HIV, treatment can potentially cure hepatitis C and Tracy Swan of the US based treatment action group has coined the phrase cure as prevention to demarcate this strategy from that as treatment as prevention for HIV. Well the concept of treatment as prevention or cure as prevention in relation to HIV involves the prioritisation and scale up of hep C treatment provision to people who are currently injecting. Now the premise is here that by successfully treating, i.e. curing hepatitis C amongst people who currently inject, hep C transmission opportunity will be reduced. Now this will reduce the pool of people with hep C in the population meaning that concepts such as viral elimination become thinkable, even potentially possible. Now this approach has been promoted by modelling work which illustrates how treatment scale up for people in jet drugs can impact on hep C population prevalence. Modelling can provide different scenarios of treatment scale up, showing the potential impact of different rates of increasing treatment numbers for different settings. Now Greg would be much better placed to talk about modelling than me, the thing to mention here is just is that these are theoretical models only. They are not generally based on practice and some of the assumptions on which they may base, be based, such as treatment take up, may prove unfounded in real world settings. They are however useful for illustrating general concepts such as the efficacy of treatment scale up for reducing transmission. Now another thing that's made um, treatment as prevention, prevention in relation to hepatitis C possible is um, developments in new treatments and this is really exciting. Um, Greg I'm sure will talk about this more but the new direct acting antivirals have um, SDR rates of over 90% for people who um, may be treatment naive, not have cirrhosis etc. More importantly they are much easier to take of a short duration, about 8 weeks and no significant side effects unlike the old interferon and ribavirin based treatments. 
Now, while some um, there are some studies looking at treatment as prevention amongst people who inject drugs, so proof of concept studies looking at whether modelling work um, can be put into practice, how realistic it really is. Um, they are currently using the old treatments. Uh, I can think of John Dillon's study in Scotland, for example, which is using interferon ribavirin and tilaprevir, and is targeting networks of people who inject drugs. So it's better um, to try to treat networks of people at the same time, because then they're not going to be reinfecting each other in the same network. Uh, and I mean, if he's able to treat people, if he's able to get networks of people interested in treatment uptake with those old drugs, well, then it would be a lot easier with the new DAAs. Okay, so that in a nutshell is treatment as prevention for hepatitis C. Now, this is potentially a really powerful advocacy tool um, in an environment where people, for, um, people who currently inject often refuse treatment on grounds of their injecting. And this is even the case where clinical guidelines recommend treatment assessment for people who are currently injecting. So, for example, in the UK, uh, since 2004, uh, NICE guidelines have said that injecting should not be a contraindication, yet people uh, tell me all the time that they've been refused treatment because they're currently injecting, because the clinician may think that they, they may miss appointments or they may not be adherent, etc. Now we know that um, treatment provided in community settings can, can um, be very successful amongst people who inject and that these fears are generally unfounded. Okay, so treatment as prevention can be um, a potentially powerful advocacy tool. Um, and this is because um, politicians prefer to listen or are more swayed by arguments that employ public health population-based rhetoric and appeals to um, cost effectiveness than appeals to human rights. And I guess this brings me on to the first of one, one of four points in which I'm going to raise some critical reflection about treatment as prevention for hepatitis C, or as Tracy Swan would say, cure as prevention. So, um, number one, uh, treatment as prevention employs a population-based, um, a population public-based, public health-based rhetoric, rather than one um, talking about uh, individual concerns and desires, whether it's ready, whether it's a time that's ready for them or not to take on treatment. Now I know that Greg's going to talk about the importance of the clinician um, attending to the individual as an individual, and of course this is uh, obvious, but the, I guess the rhetoric involved in treatment as prevention can evoke some fears about whether a population-based impetus for um, scaling up treatment may um, may result in mandatory or coercive treatment, especially in settings where um, power balances, uh, power imbalances are acute, such as drug and alcohol settings and prisons. Now in the current context where uh, the cost of the new direct acting antivirals are so high, I don't believe that we are going to see mandatory or coercive treatment for people who inject drugs, but I do believe that these fears um, are valid and need to be addressed and this is mainly around the language employed. So, for example, population-based population -based rhetoric sorry, um, can, can, can be unintentionally alienating and stigmatising. Uh, so, for example, talking about people in the affected community in terms of their transmission potential rather than their needs and desires as individuals can, uh, is not a great way to engage with the affected community. Okay, so this brings me on to my second point, which hopefully I'll articulate a little bit better. And that's about um, the need for uh, prevention as prevention initiatives to be acknowledged and scaled up alongside treatment as prevention. Uh, I think there's been a fear articulated that treatment as prevention may undermine prevention as prevention initiatives. Now prevention as prevention, so harm reduction initiatives such as opiate substitution therapy and needle syringe exchange, are often politically unpalatable, under-resourced, uh, in some countries prohibited. And, um, you know, if, if the figures that I've got in my mind are anything to go by, which is two needles and syringes per person per month globally, then they're woefully inadequate. And, um, and uh, 
yeah, I'm not sure if those figures, but they're, they're in a sort of a roundabout ballpark. And even in the UK, where needle and syringe programs uh, are meant to be widespread, people are telling me that they don't want to access needles and syringes from the pharmacy because it might be used um, by the pharmacy as pharmacist as a reason not to dispense. They don't want to access needles and syringes from the drug and alcohol setting because the uh, key worker might find out and might use that as a reason to take away their methadone takeaway, so for example. So we have to look about look at the mechanisms by which prevention is prevention is employed as well. And uh, it's very important that treatment is prevention is part of a three pronged approach that includes the scale up of OST and NSP as well. And this has been acknowledged in some modeling work. Uh, such as that done by Natasha, Natasha Martin, Peter Vickerman and Matt Hickman. Okay, third point, treatment as prevention must not undermine social structural interventions. Not that there's that many pleasant, presently to undermine. I guess a better way to put this is that um, treatment as prevention and the hope that's being brought about by these new treatments, you know, one for a day, much easier, etc. Uh, must not be as seen as a panacea for uh, you know, for all ills, and that there is no need then to to focus on the barriers uh, for people who inject drugs that are currently accessing services. So, for example, barriers such as poverty, homelessness, and for women in particular, fear of being identified as a drug user, fear of having their children taken away by social services, which is the reason that uh, many women may not access services and buy their methadone on the street, for example. So there is a need for initiatives that involve the affected community that are based um, on empowerment and on um, addressing some of these fundamental social structural barriers, which I believe would also address uh, the criminalisation and stigmatisation of people who do drugs. Okay. So this brings me on to my fourth point, which is about involving the affected community. For prevention initiatives to be assessed successful, including those, in, including those involving treatment, it is vital that the, um, the affected community is involved, that they endorse the, um, the initiatives, and fundamentally that they um, are involved in, in the development and implementation and oversight of these initiatives. So not just in a, um, a tokenistic way. Uh, now I think that um, while there are concerns around treatment and prevention, this could be a political, this could be potentially, oh I'm going to try notes now, sorry. So this could be a valuable impetus for community mobilisation and engagement. Now you think about HIV, community mobilisation and engagement were, complete, were absolutely fundamental to access to HIV treatment but are woefully lacking in regard to hepatitis C. And I think there are many reasons for this including the systemic um, criminalisation and discrimination of the affected community. However, I believe that treatment prevention can be um, a powerful impetus for community mobilisation and engagement. And what I, and thanks to Tracy Swan for this, would like to see is what would a community-based community concept for treatment as prevention or cure as prevention look like? How would people who inject drugs like to see these initiatives developed? And what are their fears and concerns in this regard? Okay, after that little garbled speech, I'm going to hand it over to Jude and Greg. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hello, I'm hoping that people can hear me. Sorry for some of the technical pitches there. Um, I um, just for the benefit of people watching, um, Magdalena is actually a lecturer and research fellow at the Centre for Research on Drugs and Health Behaviour at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, I want to thank the two presenters for some very thought-provoking issues that they've raised in their presentations and I would like to encourage you all to get those questions. So if you've got questions for Jude or questions in relation to Magdalena's presentation that perhaps Jude or Greg can address um, once Greg finished his presentation, then please get them through to us now. So our final speaker for today is Professor Greg Dorr. 
Uh, Greg is the head of the Viral Hepatitis Clinical Research Program at the Kirby Institute. And he's been involved in viral hepatitis and HIV epidemiology and clinical research and public health policy for over 20 years. He's led several major projects evaluating hepatitis C treatment among people who inject drugs and has worked closely with community-based organisations including ABLE and NUA. So I will hand over now for our final speaker, Professor Greg Dorff. Thanks very much Angela and um, welcome to everyone on the webinar. Um, what I was going to try and do is give, just give you an overview of hepatitis C treatment prevention and look, look at whether it's feasible at all. Um, I'll preface this with uh, the statement that I am one of those epidemiologists that uh, sometimes use population-based rhetoric as Magdalena outlined, um, but, uh, who inject drugs. So I'd like to think I could look at it from, from different perspectives. Um, but I think epidemiology can really give us some ideas about uh, different public health uh, intervention strategies and, and we really do need to to include things like modelling to try and inform uh, as whether anything's feasible at all. So just in terms of definitions, I think it's really important to look at uh, definitions. There's been a lot of um, discussion recently because of the new therapies that uh, we will be able to eradicate uh, hepatitis C uh, due to these amazing new treatments. So I think looking at these definitions is important. If we look at eradication to start off with, um, basically, eradication is, as it stated, complete and permanent worldwide reduction to zero new cases. So to think that we could achieve this in hepatitis C with a therapeutic intervention is absolute pie in the sky stuff. It's not going to happen. Um, there's never been an infectious disease that's been eradicated with a therapeutic intervention. Uh, the only infectious diseases that have been eradicated have been with uh, vaccine-based uh, strategies. And I think this absolutely will be the case with hepatitis C. Uh, there is no prospect of eradicating hepatitis C from, from the world through scaling up uh, treatment. But hopefully treatment can reduce the disease burden that's growing related to hepatitis C. Elimination is also very difficult to achieve, but, but not as difficult as eradication because what it describes is a reduction to very low numbers of infections occurring in a defined sort of geographical area or a defined uh, population. Um, but, but even getting the rates of infections down to levels that would uh, lead us to a definition of elimination is going to be difficult. And in terms of the, the global response to polio, for example, uh, has taken decades and decades to, to get it down to a very low level. And we still see uh, the occasional sort of outbreaks of polio. Um, so look, this is a, a very difficult task and those who sort of throw around glibly uh, the word eradication really don't uh, understand what they're talking about in terms of public health uh, uh, policy. So we have some modelling work to show that um, it could work and I mean it can work in terms of providing prevention benefit. Um, I'm not saying it can work as in terms of eradicating hepatitis C. Um, some of the work that we're done with um, Tasha Martin and Peter Vickerman, looked at uh, different sort of settings because I think it's uh, informative to contrast the situation in different sort of settings in terms of how difficult this might be. So we looked at the situation in Edinburgh, uh, Melbourne and Vancouver and they are somewhat contrasting in terms of the epidemiology among affected populations, people who inject drugs. So if you look at, for example, the chronic hepatitis C prevalence, it's uh, lowest in Edinburgh and highest in Vancouver and around about 50% in Melbourne. Um, if you look at the estimated size of the population who inject drugs, they also differ. And the one thing that is pretty similar is the, the treatment uptake rate. It's universally low. So even though you've got 8 per thousand in Edinburgh and an estimated 1 per thousand in Melbourne, they're all incredibly low treatment uptake rate. So all less than 1% of people coming forward uh, to be able to access uh, therapy per year. So that's sort of the, the, the baseline sort of parameters. What the model then does is it takes what the current treatment rate, rate is uh, with the current treatment in a fear on arrived viral, um, and then it says, well, if we get hold of improved therapies, what difference could we make? 
they can see that with the error of clavirivir and bofepirivir in the green, that the treatment rate really hasn't changed, and that's certainly been the situation uh, both for the broader population of people with hepatitis C in Australia, but also for those uh, people who inject drugs. We really haven't seen an increase in treatment uptake because of the toxicity um, of these first direct acting antivirals. But we believe that once we move into the interferon free era, that we will have the potential at least to scale up. So what the model does is it says, okay, we're going to go from a, a rate of very low, less than 1%, we're going to scale up to different sort of treatment rates um, over a few years, and then we're going to hold those treatment rates and see what impact we might have. So if we first look at Embra, and remember Embra had the lowest prevalence of hepatitis C, at around 25% of people with uh, active or chronic infection. And you can see the treatment scale-up rate. So the scale-up rates are 10 per thousand, that's treating 1% of people with chronic infection per year, right through to 80 per thousand, or 8%. Uh, being treated per year. And you can see even at a level um, which I don't think is a, a crazy level at all of say 4% per annum, people coming forward being able to access uh, treatment, that by 2022 you can get to very low levels of treatment, um, so it's very low levels of prevalence among the population um, who inject drugs. Now look, this is a model, uh, models by definition tend to be somewhat simplistic. They certainly don't build in the levels of diversity and heterogeneity that we, we know are evident within these populations. Um, but at least they give us some sort of idea about what impact we potentially could have. We then move to the situation in Melbourne where the, the prevalence is somewhat higher at 50% baseline prevalence. And you really would need to scale up to about 8% of people being treated each year to get to relatively low levels of prevalence by 2027. So it's going to be a much tougher task given a similar treatment scale-up level um, in Melbourne versus Edinburgh. If we then move to Vancouver, it's going to be even more difficult because of this considerably high sort of baseline uh, prevalence of over 60% of uh, people who inject drugs having chronic hepatitis C. Um, so you can get sort of moderate uh, effects um, if you get to those sort of high levels of treatment uptake, uh, but it's going to take much, much longer to get to low levels of prevalence among the population given the same sort of treatment scale. -up. Now I've been talking about sort of potentially getting to 8% of people being treated per year uh, with these new sort of therapies, but we've got to go from a very sort of low level of treatment uptake uh, in all populations, in pretty much all settings. This is a, a figure. Uh, that looks at the diagnosis rate um, along one axis, where Australia is doing pretty well. You can see about 85% of our uh, population is estimated to have been diagnosed. And on, on the other axis is the treatment rate. So we're doing not so well with about 1 to 1.5% of people being treated per year. You know, countries like Germany and France are doing significantly better at about 4 to 5%. But 8% is above any setting, any country setting, in terms of the treatment uptake. And this is across the broader population. Clearly, those uh, percentages among highly marginalised populations would be somewhat lower in, in all sort of uh, circumstances and settings. So look, this is a big ask in terms of getting the treatment scale up to where we need it to be. Um, we also need not just interferon-free therapy, we need probably perfect view in terms of the type of interferon-free regimen that we would like uh, to achieve the best outcomes. And that, and that would have, in terms of key attributes, very high efficacy, and preferably above 90%. Minimal toxicity, so it needs to be very well tolerated. Um, preferably it should be once daily dosing to, to improve uh, treatment delivery. It needs to be active against all genotypes, and that's incredibly important. In Australia we have about 50, 55% do have genotype 1, but a large proportion of people have non-1 strains or genotypes. Preferably, uh, the shorter the duration, the better. Um, it looks like we'll get down to 12 weeks, but there's um, preliminary data that suggests that we should be able to get down to six weeks and maybe even lower than that. There's phase two studies that are now evaluating uh, six and four week duration in a on free therapy. Um, and it needs to be low cost. If it's going to be effective as a public health intervention, um, this therapy cannot be tens of thousands of dollars uh, in terms of uh, the outlays. 
Um, this is a figure that just demonstrates that diversity in terms of the genotype dis distribution across the globe. So ideally we would have you know, maybe not completely a one-size-fits-all, but a regimen that would be active against all the major genotypes around the world. And we're, we're heading in that direction. Um, the first sort of regimens that were developed were predominantly targeted at genotype 1, but subsequent regimens are looking uh, as if they will be pan-genotypic. And this is just one example. This is the phosphovir, uh, the nucleotide analog from Gilead, uh, combined with their second generation NS5A inhibitor, GS5816, in a phase 2 study with relatively small numbers. But you can see with the different genotypes, um, the sustained virological response or cure of infection rate being above 90% across all the genotypes. And this is a, a regimen that's already co-formulated as a one pill once a day uh, option. So this looks like it'll go forward. Uh, it may take another sort of couple of years to be fully evaluated and available. But there are other companies that are developing pan-genotypic and probable once daily dosing regimens. But as has been pointed out earlier, um, why don't we do prevention as prevention? And clearly that's a, a pretty uh, decent sort of stance to put forward. Um, so for treatment as prevention or cure as prevention to have an impact, uh, we'd need a foundation of enhanced harm reduction. Um, why do we need that? Well, we need it because combination prevention strategies will be more effective. We know that in practice on the ground. We also know that through modelling work. I think other harm reduction strategies are a crucial engagement point uh, for the population of people who inject drugs in terms of uh, having access to uh, not just treatment but testing, referral, and appropriate care and uh, appropriate um, addressing other issues that may be relevant for in individuals. And harm reduction is clearly required for HIV prevention. You shouldn't forget about that. Uh, we've had an incredibly successful harm reduction um, network in Australia that's kept HIV rates very low among people who inject drugs. This just points out that if we look globally in terms of harm reduction strategies, that a minority of countries have implemented needle and syringe programs. We know how effective and also how cost effective NFPs are. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done globally in terms of the moving forward with harm reduction. We also know that a minority uh, in fact, uh, only 35% of countries have imp implemented any significant uh, uh, opioid substitution treatment program. And again, this is one of the pillars of you know, broad sort of uh, harm reduction that is required if we're going to get uh, effective uh, prevention moving forward. Um, and we need, but we need, do need evaluation in different settings. I, I think um, anyone that, that does sort of research uh, would like to think that they go into sort of projects with an open mind. And I'm not of the view that treatment prevention is definitely going to work. I'm of the view that this is a strategy that should be evaluated and evaluated properly. So potential settings that the strategy should be evaluated, obviously community-based uh, populations of people who inject drugs and Margaret Hellard at the Burnett Institute is leading a treatment prevention study that should start later this year in Melbourne. Uh, prison setting, I think most people are aware that uh, we're putting together a treatment prevention project in New South Wales prisons. Um, particularly among HIV infected MSM, there's an opportunity uh, to look at treatment prevention uh, with a, a project that we'll probably move forward with in the Australian context in this population. Perinatal transmission is another interesting area. I think there's a, uh, the potential to treat uh, women who are pregnant the third trimester to obviously cure their infection, but also to prevent the around 5% transmission risk to their infants through perinatal transmission. Um, in terms of treatment prevention more broadly, I think there's some core principles um, that we should uh, not forget. Um, individual health benefit has to be central. Now, that, that's an obvious thing to say, um, but if you are not caring for individuals, then no broad-based population strategy is going to be effective. Uh, community partnerships and development implementation uh, are crucial. Uh, these tra treatment prevention strategies should enhance rather than undermine harm reduction measures. And the impact of risk behaviour should be a component of the evaluation. So there's been some concern on the HIV treatment prevention side that um, improved antiretroviral therapy uh, has led to increased risk behaviour. And this is something that we would want to uh, evaluate as a component of any treatment prevention strategy. And I think there's also been concern voiced about what about reinfection? Uh, would people 
uh, be more or less likely to come forward for, for treatment because of concern about reinfection. So I think it's feasible to build in access to retreatment for individuals who may, may be reinfected. Just in terms of acknowledgement, uh, various sort of collaborators on the work that we do uh, around treatment prevention, but also the, the broader sort of work that we do in relation to improving access to treatment and care for people who inject drugs. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Um, well, lots of issues raised in all of those presentations and I think um, themes throughout um, all the presenters is that um, the need to not take our eye off the wall when it comes to harm, harm reduction more broadly and um, as Jude commented, um, you know, prevention as prevention and um, looking at what we know, what we currently know works. Um, Got a few questions for the presenters. So, as I said, we've got still got uh, Greg. Unfortunately, we, we can't look at uh, Greg, but you get to look at me and Jude. Um, got a few questions through, and keep sending them through because I can see them popping up. Um, I'll just one of the questions that came through prior to the webinar, and I'll start with that. Um, and both Jude and uh, Greg might want to comment on this. Um, the question states that in a recent letter to the journal Hepatology, Michael Levi and Sarah Lani state that the limited options for prisoners wishing to protect themselves against reinfection pose a significant challenge to the success of HCV treatment as prevention in prison settings. Anecdotally, prisoners are choosing to defer treatment entry in the absence of the ability to protect themselves from reinfection. Do you agree that this is a significant challenge? And if so, what are its implications? So, Angela, do you want me to address that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you raised some of the limited the issues around limited provision of NSP in prisons in your presentation as well. Yeah, so okay, I think the letter brings up a number of issues. Um, I think, firstly, it brings up the importance of doing qualitative research among prisoners around their attitudes to treatment, uh, also around their understanding of the risk of you know, reinfection and the, their attitude to the lack of you know, comprehensive harm reduction measures within the prison sort of setting. Um, part of the broader sort of project that we're doing in, in New South Wales prisons will include qualitative research to, to really look at some of those, those issues. Um, I like not to go on anecdotes, that's why I think the, the further research is, is crucial. Um, but I can acknowledge that there may be people that may stand back from coming forward for treatment because of the concern that what's the point of getting rid of hepatitis C if I can't prevent myself from becoming reinfected while I'm incarcerated, and that clearly is a concern. Um, what I would say though is that these sorts of projects in terms of evaluating treatment uh, in different settings provides enormously useful data um, to, to tell us what is feasible, what are the issues, what, what are the barriers, what are the potential impact. Um, if we're moving forward with, for example, a treatment prevention sort of concept in the prison setting, it will be very much dependent on a range of issues. Uh, it will be dependent on whether we can inform uh, prisoners about what we're doing. It'll be dependent on whether prisoners, once informed, are willing and able to come forward to, to access therapy and want to access therapy at that particular time point. And it'll be dependent on what the treatment outcomes are and what the risk of reinfection in that sort of context of incarceration without comprehensive harm reduction is. But until we do the projects, we won't know um, what those uh, outcomes are. So I think it's really crucial to evaluate these strategies. I think it's also crucial to evaluate a prison-based needle and syringe program and that hopefully will move forward in an ACT prison in the not too distant future. And I don't think either of these things should preclude the other. Uh, in fact, if a prison-based NSP is evaluated well 
and treatment prevention is also evaluated well, we'd be very keen to look at combining those strategies in terms of getting uh, to improve sort of impact in terms of uh, uh, prevention within the context of, of, of a prison setting. Um, so I mean, I think that's covered some of those issues that the letter has brought up, and as I said, it's a really important issue to to try and address. But the connection was briefly lost. Jude, did you have any comments that you wanted to make on that? Doesn't come as any surprise. And I suppose I'm sorry you cut out a bit for me there. I'm not sure if it's for others, but um, you know I think reflecting on what both yourself and Magdalena raised around you know the possibilities of forced treatment um, and you know, also considering whether prison settings might be um, an environment where that kind of approach could be trialled. There's something that I wanted to talk to, to Greg about, Angela, because when he was, he said she was quite, his, his language was really moderate and he was talking about what elimination meant and what um, eradication meant, but I, I'm on the WHO steering committee and advisory committee on hepatitis C and we had a meeting at the AIDS conference last week. Andrew Ball, who's you know, one of the, the main players in, in WHO and hepatitis C, was talking about viral elimination. And he kept saying viral elimination. So although you know, you're, you're being very tempered in your approach, Greg, you know, out there where this rhetoric's being run around, it, it's much more expansive and it's much more, um, they're, not being, they're not being nearly as considered as you are. And they really are talking quite um, frightening terms about how important this um, new modelling data can be and the implications it may have, which is why, you know, when I gave my presentation I was talking in terms of how problematic that seemed to us because they're not being considered in what they're saying. So, you know, then we consider the, the worst sort of case scenario, if you know what I mean. Mm. Yeah, Jude, could I absolutely agree. I, the irony is that many of the people that are pushing the eradication barrow are in fact the more conservative clinicians that wouldn't go anywhere near people who are actively injecting. Um, but they have this sort of view that now with these amazing new therapies we'll be able to completely solve this problem and eradicate the virus. And in fact they, ha they hold meetings um, and have to be forced to include topics that address issues uh, among people that inject drugs. So if you even start to think about sort of treatment prevention sort of potential, and you're not thinking about the, the major populations that are affected by this, this virus, um, then you're living in la-la land. Um. Well, there seems to be quite a few of them. Sounds like la-la land is a popular um, inhabitant place, <laughs> inhabited by quite a few. <laughs> um, but as, as I said before, I think I, I'm trying to sort of not um, sort of um, separate, uh, and I think this is a risk, separate the issues that need to be addressed for individuals in terms of improving their health with the potential through that to provide some additional benefit. Um, as I said, in terms of core principles, the improvement of an individual's health needs to be you know, the underlying sort of reason why you go forward with an intervention such as you know, even a, a simple interferon-free sort of therapeutic regimen. Um, until those issues that are, are addressed at the in individual level and until all the other social and health concerns that you've raised are you know, addressed in a comprehensive manner, there's no way that you would ever get a treatment prevention sort of impact. Um, so um, I'm not naive to those you know, some of those issues, but I think there are people out there that, that are you know, much more naive than, than I am. One of the uh, questions that's come through that kind of links with that in terms of definitely treatment uptake was um, a question about any ideas, and this was specifically in relation to the ACT government, but I imagine there may be other examples um, of 
the gatekeeper role that liver clinics can function in and that that, you know, whether there's any um, ideas that you would have for pressuring um, those working in liver clinics to facilitate more access to treatments. And the comment here is that currently only 50 people in the ACT are accessing hep C treatment per year and very few of these are people who reject them. Um, don't get me going on access to treatment in ACT. <laughs> um, um, it is a problem, it's interesting, we were down there giving a, a forum educating people around hepatitis C. Um, at, in Canberra, with that much sort of support from the existing treatment services there. So look, it's a concern. It's a concern um, not just in Canberra, but in, in many sort of settings where there are not available uh, diversity of models of care that provide access to you know, people with hepatitis C to come forward. Um, we've been trying to sort of you know, lead a, a push to get expanded access through different models of care, including primary care-based treatment, obviously treatment in the, in the setting of, of opiate pharmacotherapy, improved you know, treatment in the prison setting, and community health clinic-based sort of treatment models. Uh, and look, that's making some headway, um, but there has been you know, a degree of conservatism um, that, that was, resides within the sort of traditional larger clinic setting that, that I think is holding back the, the issues and hopefully we'll be able to overcome that in, in, in the near future. Just on that, Greg, and I just wonder what, to what extent do you think concerns um, around reinfection play in that, even though we know that it's quite low, do you think that's a real impact on this kind of gatekeeping that goes on? Well, it's very interesting that um, once sort of there's already considerable stigma and discrimination. We all know that, um, but once the sort of high price of these new therapies um, sort of becomes part of the equation, so to speak, and, and hopefully it won't be part of the equation in the clinical setting in Australia. But if you look at the United States, um, with the high prices that uh, is being required for these new therapeutic regimen. Um, I'm going back to anecdotes, and I said anecdotes are not great to depend upon, but there, there are more than I think just one or two anecdotes. But there appears to be a view from the payers for treatment in you know, such as does the patient you know, continue to use drugs prior to giving approval for access. So you know, even though someone might have insurance, um, that the payers are holding back because of a sort of a judgment call uh, in terms of whether that person is deserving uh, for these sort of expensive therapies. So look, that is a very, very dangerous road, obviously. Um, thankfully, I, I don't think it will go down that road here in Australia, but it just gives you an example of what can happen in terms of you know, potentially some increased stigma and discrimination. Uh, because of uh, the, the cost, at least the existing cost of these new, new regimens. Mm -hmm. Like you say, particularly if cost becomes, um, and will to some degree, has to, as such a, becomes a big player in the discourse around how treatment will be ramped up and who it will be targeted towards and, and all of those issues. So, um, I've got another question. I've got a few questions here, so I'm just keen to get through as many as we can. I'm not sure. Um, this question says, what about PrEP for hep C? Okay, so I'm often asked about both um, PEP and PrEP. So for those um, who are unaware, PEP is post-exposure prophylaxis that we use in the setting of HIV exposure, um, where the treatment started generally uh, within the first day or two after the exposure. PrEP is where you take a therapy sort of continuously uh, to prevent sort of infection. I think probably they're getting it PEP rather than PrEP. So for example, if you had a needle stick uh, exposure either in the, either in the setting of sharing injecting equipment or in the setting of you know, say hospital-based care of people with hepatitis C, would it make sense to use post-exposure prophylaxis? Now, I don't think so. And the, the reasons why I don't think so are that 
the risk from a single sort of uh, event, there's a little bit of uncertainty around this. But the, the risk is thought to be a couple of percent, maybe 3% maximum. Now, that would mean that you would need to treat 100 people to prevent those three infections, one of which would probably be cleared spontaneously, so two infections that would become chronic infections. So to treat 100 people to prevent two infections doesn't make much sense when those two infections are highly curable, so if detected early. So the difference with HIV is it's incurable. So you know, with hepatitis C, the important strategy, I think, needs to be, well, we need to monitor the early infection. As soon as we have evidence of infection, we can either wait for spontaneous clearance or start treatment early. So I think that will become the strategy. Uh, and with these new therapies, you may be able to get to even shorter durations if you treat early. So I'm talking about potentially getting down to six or even four weeks of therapy for chronic hepatitis C. Possibly in the early infection period, you might only need two or three weeks of therapy. So that's one of the areas that we're going to be sort of looking at in terms of our research at the Kirby in the coming years. Can you get the very short durations of therapy for very early infections? So I think that will be the strategy rather than treating all people who may have been exposed. Um, going back through, one of the questions is more in relation to harm reduction services and Charles has asked, why do you think the harm reduction services have difficulty convincing policy and government that harm reduction has obvious benefits due to reduced barriers and improved pathways precisely because they are in contact with the majority of the incidence and prevalence individuals affected by FC. You want me to address that, Angela? Or Jude? I, I just didn't hear the end of it, Angela. Can you just repeat? Yeah, I suppose the question is, you know, why do harm reduction services have difficulty convincing policymakers and government um, that harm reduction has obvious benefits in, in terms of reducing barriers, improving pathways to treatment when they are the people that are most in contact with the people affected by Hep C. So, you know, why is there that disconnect between the knowledge that harm reduction services have when they know that they are having the most contact with the key population? Look, I, I think it just comes back to that same old moral dilemma. Pe you know, people don't believe that people should use drugs and certainly not inject them. So um, it, 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 it all needs to come back to that. I've been thinking about this for 40 years and, and I can't understand people's hesitance and, and their reluctance to use supportive interventions from, for our community. And the only thing that makes any sense is, is moralism and, and, and judgment. Um, there's nothing else. I don't know the reason for it. Greg, can you? I mean, yeah, like I think Joe's right because if you look at the pure health economic side of it, the needle exchange programs are not just cost effective, they're cost savings. And that's a very, very big difference. So we're talking about treatments being cost effective, which means that, okay, they come under the sort of the magic sort of number of, well, if you extend life by a quality adjusted life year. Um, you know, it's going to cost you less than, say, $40,000 for that extra year of life. Um, but cost saving means that you're actually saving the population money completely by introducing them. So it would cost the community an enormous amount more without this intervention. So in terms of a public health intervention, this is as good as it gets in terms of cost effectiveness. Um, so why, given that, um, you know, don't we sort of even enhance them further. So I think Jude's right. I, I think it's because the community attitudes, even though they may have shifted a bit, the majority of the community still has problems dealing with the illicitness of drug use. And they can't get their heads around the fact that people choose to do things that are currently sort of illegal. Now, if we decriminalise drug use, would, would that completely change the community attitudes? Maybe. Maybe not, but I think the illicitness is giving many in the community an out, so to speak, in maintaining those attitudes. Um, so I think there's a balance. There's a balance between the public health benefits and people in the, the health sector are very aware of that, 
with the community sort of attitude and the political sort of side of that. So look, we've been reasonably pragmatic in Australia. We've done much, much better than, than most countries on, on those fronts. And I hope that's um, maintained and enhanced. But I would hope that the network in terms of harm reduction that's been established could be built upon because it has the potential to provide a lot more. So running a look at examples such as Kirkton Road Centre, um, where they do a comprehensive package of prevention as well as care and treatment service provision, and that sort of holistic sort of approach that brings together prevention, care and treatment has to be the way forward. So you know, we need multiple community health clinics like Kirkton Road across the country. You know, there's a few, but we need you know, dozens and dozens of them uh, if we're going to improve uh, the well-being and health of, of people who inject drugs. And I must say, just on that point about having the evidence, even if you just look at the economic evidence, I think you know, for those of us that attended um, the conference last week, I couldn't count the number of times I sat in a session where you know, the slides, the overwhelming evidence, and it seems to be that there are particular parts of the world that want to promote, which is essentially a moral message on drug use, at any cost. And that includes economic and cost of life. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, you know, that's unfortunately a stark reality in some other countries in a more extreme way than Australia, but it's definitely there throughout the globe. Um, You've answered one of the questions there, Greg, in talking about the combination that combining harm reduction and treatment and um, increasing access to that, that kind of model. Um, I've got a longer question here and I'll try and read it out in a way that makes sense. Um, God, it's really hard. <laughs> Charles, you should touch there. What measures do you see when the focus is on medical legal issues and punitive consequences rather than the overall treatment planning for HCV in particular. For example, with induction onto OST, bloods are taken, but results aren't delivered or followed up in New Zealand. This is from Charles saying this. Um, yeah, I, I, guess, I guess what Charles is saying. Um, so, so what he's saying, I think, is that you know, there's a sort of you know, a requirement to do some screening, do some testing, you know, when you, people are being uh, entered into an OST type program. So it's, you know, it's part of the sort of the package that is required to be done, and there may be medical legal consequences if it's not done. So they do a bit of testing, to HFC, and uh, um, but that's about it. You know, that's all they do. Um, now it's not simple, but one of the issues is that most OST-based services are not funded to do proper hepatitis C assessment and uh, care and treatment. So that's not just in New Zealand, and that's in Australia. Um, you know, the vast majority of OST services don't have the capacity um, and they haven't had the investment in building in these sorts of programs. Now we've had a few programs start up and a bit of funding come through to, to complement and start up some other sort of programs which have been very welcome, particularly in New South Wales, but, but it's still a very small proportion if you look at the broader sort of OST sort of setting. So what needs to be done is that there needs to be better partnership between the components of the health department that are responsible uh, for OST and parts of the health department are responsible for delivering hepatitis C assessment, care and treatment services. And so I'm trying to get those people working together. Um, you know, hasn't been easy in different sort of jurisdictions, but that needs to happen. Um, and we're trying to sort of move that forward, particularly in New South Wales at the moment. Um, but you know, there's a bit of sort of, well, who, whose responsibility is it? Well, it should be the responsibility of healthcare. And, uh, and that, that means that you need a more sort of comprehensive sort of approach. If the population is able to be engaged through certain services that are providing one element in terms of, you know, um, say OST, well then that's an obvious um, foundation to at least build some sort of improved services that provide a broader approach such as proper assessment for hepatitis C and, and provision of care and treatment. 
Do you want to make any comments there, G? Look, I need to say, did Charles say that once they take the blood, even the client doesn't get any um, information on, on the results? I think Judy's meaning that yeah, the, the ball's basically pretty dropped after. There might be some, I don't know whether he means that there's no post-test counselling, but I imagine he means that, look, you know, they just do that and they don't really follow up with sort of taking the next sort of steps. Oh, okay, because I, I thought he was in, in, indicating that um, you didn't even get your results, which, you know. Well, that might be possible in some cases, I'm sure, as well. Yeah. That's appalling. It's quite probable in some cases where, you know, people go through a raft of, you know, processes, induction processes to, to get onto the OST program and, and like you say, those bloods are taken and perhaps maybe results are presented and then left. And, and you know, like for some people, particularly injecting drug users, um, there has been anecdotally, and I know, you know, there's that, there's still um, practitioners out there saying that if, you, if you're a current injecting drug user, you know, treatment is not an option for you or you should wait. Um, so maybe that's part of the picture as well. I'm not sure what the um, New Zealand situation is overall, but certainly the case here in Australia is that. But given one of the issues that for drug users having blood taken is one of the, the horrors around getting treatment, getting any testing, so if you've had your blood taken, to not then have that used in the most effective manner is almost criminally negligent because, you know, that's one blood test that you don't have to have which may then assist you onto a treatment program if you want to. So, you know, I don't know if that's what's happening, Charles, but, but if it is, let's get together and see what we can do about it. You at least need your own test results. That's a minimum. Well, yeah, I'm not sure if that's what um, maybe Charles can answer. I'm not sure if that's what he's implying, but I'm sure it could happen on in, situ in some situations. Um, there's one um, other question just sitting here um, that I, it's kind of at a tangent, but not really, given what we're talking about. And there's a question here in terms of um, decriminalisation of drug use. Um, and the, it says, apart from the Portugal experience, can you direct us to any contemporary evidence that supports the case for decriminalisation? Well, there's some around marijuana, but I don't think there's anything else about other drugs that I know of. Greg, what about you? No, um, that's not really um, my area, but all I would say is that it's a bit of a, a no-brainer in the sense that um, decriminalisation would you know, bring down you know, some of the barriers to providing effective you know, health and social sort of, uh, programs. I mean, I, you know, I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, that the fact that we incarcerate you know, large proportions of the population is just, just like ludicrous. Now, I mean, I was I should be across this stuff in terms of epidemiology pretty well, but we're doing a project called Live a Life that we're rolling out through different uh, community health clinics and, and methadone clinics, and we did our first sort of um, component of that at Kirkton Road, and within those people that were enrolled into the program, 70% have been incarcerated and 30% in the last 12 months. Um, that was just a stark reminder uh, of what you know, uh, we're faced with and what the population of people who inject drugs are faced with in terms of you know, criminalisation of drug use. Um, now you might say, well, you're sort of you know, doing a, a project in the prison system. Um, yes, we're doing it because we're sort of pragmatists as well. We understand well, that's the situation at the moment. We're trying to sort of work within that context doesn't mean that we you know, um, in any way sort of are in favour of you know, what is currently in place. And, you know, um, just keep going, because it's fresh in my mind, last week, again, I, I was at, at the AIDS conference and there was, um, they were talking about, this was a US study, but I wouldn't be surprised if we had some similarly horrifying stats that um, 60 to 70 percent of inj injecting drug use, quite a large study where it had had been imprisoned at some point and that injecting drug users um, once leaving prison were, it was, it was something like 90% more likely to be re, so returned to prison within two years. So, well, so the, the incarceration period in the United States are much longer for an individual sort of inverted commas crime um, than they are in, in the Australian sort of context as well. Yeah, yeah, there are some big differences between the US um, 
And so there was a question I think from Charles about generic drugs. Um, so I might just quickly sort of address that. Is that okay? The question because I haven't seen that one. So it's, it was a question around. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about generic drugs for hepatitis C. You know, what's sort of the view about that? Um, and look, there's no doubt that we're heading down a somewhat similar pathway to HIV treatment, where there will be production of generic drugs. So just what generic drugs do is it provide you know, drugs at much, much you know, lower price than the pharmaceutical companies you know, uh, cost the, the drugs at. So, for example, so Fosfavir at the moment in the United States, 12 weeks, 84,000 US. Now, there's already some generic partnerships with the, the pharmaceutical companies to provide so Fosfavir at about $300 a month, so that's sort of $900 for a 12-week course. So it's about 1% of the listed price in the United States. So for people in low and middle income countries, and there's an agreement that's been uh, um, entered into between Gilead and the generic producers in India is to provide drugs for 60 countries. Now there's some problems with that arrangement and the agreement, and a lot of countries are left off that list, but at least it's a a start down a pathway that hopefully will provide you know, much cheaper access to people in low and middle income countries. Now there's still um, a problem, and this, there's going to be a problem probably in Australia and other high income countries, in that uh, even if we get a 50% discount on the price from the United States, it's still going to be like 40 or 50,000 for a 12 week course. Um, and the government, I don't think, is going to, to let the floodgates open in terms of demand. So um, we will need considerable further price reductions on that before I think that these therapies will be broadly available to people with hepatitis C irrespective of disease stage. And we, we think that probably initially they'll limit the use to people with more significant underlying liver disease, potentially advanced uh, fibrosis. Um, because of the potential blowout in cost. So it's not just a low and middle income country issue around drug pricing, it's a high income country issue as well. But we won't be using generic drugs in high income countries. That won't happen. Um, but what hopefully will happen is that as other companies come through and produce uh, other regimens, there'll be a lot of competitive pricing, undercutting of, of existing prices, and that will drive the price down, as has seen happen with any retroviral therapy. Of Gilead had a thing in the Indian High Court saying Sevosavir wasn't new enough, didn't have enough newness in its, in its patent to be called a new drug. So I don't see how they're working with Gilead to do a, um, a generic. I, I, they're in court. No, Joe, there's a group, an Indian group, that have taken that to a court in India. That doesn't preclude um, Gilead from signing an arrangement with an Indian generic production company to produce the drug. At, at lower sort of prices. Um, that generic production in India will then supply most of these other countries. So the main generic producers are in India. There's also generic production companies in Thailand and, and Brazil, <coughs> but the main country <coughs> is India. Yeah, it goes around and ties down the prices to something that it finds acceptable in, in all those countries, yeah. There's also been some work around how much it actually costs to produce, not obviously the investment that goes into development of the agents, but once you've done all that investment and you're getting all your profits from the, from the US and other high income countries, how much would it cost to sort of spit the drugs out of the factory? Um, and for Sophosbevere, it would cost about $100 for a 12-week course. Um, so they're not expensive uh, compounds for manufacture. So um, there's still a you know, profit margin there that generic companies will obviously uh, be taking because they, they need to make a profit if they're going to continue as well. Greg, if, if the idea or hope um, is that we see a significant or at least um, you know, an improvement in the uptake of treatment, um, how does that fit with this you know, quite targeted and specific you know, that the, the treatment would be aimed at people at, at, with advanced um, stage hep C? So you know, those two things sort of seem to work against one another. Are they coming from the same people or the same quarters or? Look, you're absolutely right. So um, if there is the restrictions that we expect to be in place, um, whereby for the new expensive interferon-free regimen that those with more advanced liver disease are the, those that can access them, there's absolutely no way 
that you'll have a treatment prevention impact. No way whatsoever. Um, the reality is that those people will be considerably older and of course there are people that are older that still uh, inject, but the large majority of people that inject uh, would be people with earlier liver disease and that, that's, the, that's the reality. Um, so the only way that you, you could potentially have a treatment prevention benefit at the population level is if you have broad access across all disease stages. So what I think needs to happen is that you know, during this sort of interim period where it might be targeted to people with more advanced disease, we need to do the, this research around whether treatment prevention is feasible at all. So that research will take some time and it may or may not be successful. Uh, and as I said, once we get more competitive pricing and the prices come down, then that sort of narrow focus for advanced liver disease I think will be broadened and the restriction by disease stage will be removed. So I'm hopeful that in several years, then it won't matter how much underlying liver disease you have because there's obviously benefits for treating and curing hepatitis C at all disease stages, we know that. Um, but I can't see that happening next year in terms of the initial listing of the interferon-3 regimen. Thank you. Um, I think that's all of the questions we have there. We're, we're coming towards the end of our allocated time as well. Um, are there any final comments, uh, Jude or Greg, that you'd like to make before we wrap up? Well, well I'd certainly like to ensure that prevention is, is more um, um, widely um, dispensed around the world and to, and I'm certainly going to make note of it and next time I hear someone standing up talking about viral um, prevention of hepatitis around the world and how possible it is at a WHO meeting, I'll say, well, you really need to talk to Dr. Dork because um, he doesn't think it's possible because, yeah, I was, I was getting really concerned about it. It was just becoming too repetitive and too, and they were so excitable about it. It was almost, it was almost like, you know, they discovered something, there was no way, no, nothing was going to stop them. So, you know, I, I think some some balance needs to be t taken up to that level where, where actually they're all just theorising and theory doesn't actually work in practice, as you know, we so often know. Thanks, Jean. Um, Angela, just to sort of reinforce what I've said before in terms of you know, the centrality of individual uh, health and uh, well-being in, in terms of any sort of broader public health intervention that you're proposing even to evaluate. And I, I think um, I noted there was a quote from Jude uh, in a, in a um, document by a treatment action group that said something like, um, I don't want to be seen as a potential transmitter, that's electricity. Um, so just to, I think language is interesting and I think um, we need to always sort of remember that there are people's lives you know, behind the, some of this stuff and, and, uh, and we need to continue to you know, be aware of the issues from all different perspectives. Right. What a great note to end on and I, um, I love that quote as well coming from you, Jude. Um, look, I'd like to thank all our presenters today for giving their time to a really important topic and um, I'm reading some of the comments coming through and I can see that People do appreciate um, us taking the time to focus on this issue from the perspective of injecting drug users and talk about some of the, if you like, elephant in the room issues, some of the really difficult pointy end of the discussion and the things that really matter in people's lives. So thank you all. Um, we will be, I believe, putting a link up to this webinar on our website, I think. Soon. So this is all being recorded, so for those of your colleagues and friends that might have missed it, um, there will be another chance. So thank you all for your participation today. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Thanks. Angela. Thanks so much. Ciao.